So when I was a kid, we used to play this game in my classroom. And this is probably when I was a grade three, four, or something like that. And we do times table challenges. And basically what you do is that you'd line up kids um, like in the board, there'd be two separate lines and the teacher would say nine times eight. And whoever wrote down first, they, they stayed in the game. And then you go until there was one person. And I loved that game. I'm not going to lie to you. It was not, it helped me learn my time tables. I'm not going to lie to you, but I also like winning. I also like the competition aspect of it. I am, uh, I love helping people, but I'm also a competitive person. I think both aspects really matter. And a lot of times when we're talking about collaboration, it's almost like we swung to one side of the pendulum. Now, am I saying you should be doing times table challenges like that? That's, that's kind of an individual teacher thing. But I know that sometimes we benefit from competition, um, but we sometimes benefit from collaboration. But it's like one is good, one is bad. But how do you actually mesh the two? How do you embrace the messiness? How do we actually both push and support? And this is why I really appreciated the conversation with Lorna and Curtis Hewson. Um, they're actually from Alberta. We recorded this today. They're literally about five minutes drive from me right now. I didn't know they were here, uh, but we recorded over soon. They could have actually come to my house and recorded it. But, um, you know, maybe they just don't want to see you. Who knows? But I think that notion of collaboration is a lot messier. Uh, than we think. And I think a lot of people, and this is one of the questions I ask them, they think they're collaborating uh, because they're talking to each other, but collaboration is more of that. And I ask, like, wh like, how do you see collaboration? Because a lot of people see it as, you know, they say it, but they don't really talk, like talk about what it means. And that that's what makes it a buzzword. So it was a great uh, conversation. You can actually check out their new book, uh, Collaborative Response. It's down in the links below. Uh, I really enjoyed this podcast. I'm really appreciative that, you know, we have uh, people from my home province putting out a new book to the world, sharing really great ideas, sharing great practices. And I know you're going to enjoy the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kuros and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am so blessed to have someone from like, they're literally in my hometown right now, right? Like, they're there, I can see them, but they're not at my house and we won't even get into that. Uh, but but uh, Lauren and Curtis Houston have a pretty distinguished career in Alberta, have done many different things. Uh, we've connected, we've actually, you know, overlapped in some of the places that we worked in. Uh, over time, they actually do have another, or they do have a new book out now. It's called Collaborative Response. I'm always proud um, when we have Alberta authors here because I think, um, you know, even with its flaws, and I think every education system has its flaws, I think mm -hmm. Alberta is one of the most, you know, forward thinking schools or, you know, um, education systems in the world. It's, that's been proven over and over again um, all over the world. So, um, Lauren and Curtis, Thank you so much uh, for being on the podcast. If you both could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us who you are and what you do today and how you got there, that'd be a great way to start. All right. You want to start? Sure. Well, thanks for having us, George. It's yeah, we're just on great it, George. to be My able pleasure. to be here. Um, so I'm Lorna Hewson, and uh, I've been an educator for a very long time. I'm not going to tell you how many years. Sure. <laughs> yeah. We're at that stage, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Good. Good. Um, number of years in the classroom, and uh, and then began to work uh, at the district level, supporting programming, supporting curriculum. Um, and in the meantime, had the opportunity to be able to start to explore how do we provide structures and supports in our school that would ensure the, that all students' needs are met, but through a collaborative process so that we access all of the expertise and the incredible knowledge mm -hmm. that is in the building. Mm -hmm. And Curtis, how about you? Like, tell us a little bit about you and how you got to where you're at. Yeah. So again, started off in the classroom, uh, moved eventually into administration, spent over a decade at uh, three different schools as administrator, last one being school in Claire's home, where we started to put some of the initial genesis of this work into right. place in a very rudimentary way when we <laughs> reflect back uh, at it now. But again, great school, great uh people doing good things for kids that really helped some of the initial thinking flow. And then uh, opportunity to teach at the U of L, U of A for a little bit. And then uh, last five years, been 
just working exclusively with schools and districts trying to figure out this collaborative response piece that we're super excited the the book's coming out uh or came out yesterday with That's some awesome. of our new thinking we had self-published oh six years ago but uh okay. yeah apparently you learn a lot in six years time and yeah collaboration is a word you know so this is you know i obviously talk about innovation people know it's the podcast is literally called the innovators mindset yeah and i think sometimes like words like innovation collaboration they become buzzwords yeah right? mm -hmm. and what i mean by when i when i say buzzwords right i mean that people say them without actually they just say them without thinking about what they even mean yeah. right we say them because we feel we should say them it's mm -hmm. like synergy Right. Like we yeah. need, like it's like a word that what does it even mean and why are you saying it? Right. And so like when you look at that, for, for example, when you talk about the notion of collaborative response or even the term collaboration, yeah. like what, what does that mean to you? What does it look like? And, and why is it like so important to education? You know, I'm so interested that you asked that, George, because that school in Claire's home, if you would have come in and said, so do you collaborate here? Everyone would have said, right. oh, yeah, yeah, we collaborate right. all the time. But what they meant was we share and we get along really well. Um, when we talk about collaboration, I, I like to talk about it as having a little bit of tension or discomfort that comes right. with it. That when we're truly collaborating, we have norms that are established that give us some ground rules to interact. But then real collaboration is when we push just mm -hmm. a little bit. We challenge and we... We do it in a way that's all about honoring and building upon the strengths of each other. But you and I can can disagree within right. this. And we have norms or ground rules that allow us that, you know, we can debate hard on topics while still really enjoying the person themselves. And to do that well, you need, or we would argue, you need structures and processes and practice. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think our... Our education system does a, a super job at really providing us experiences and tools to really collaborate well. I know when I was teaching at the university, that wasn't something I was really helping prep um, right. pre-service teachers with. So it's um, when we say collaboration, we we mean a, a, a process that can have um tension and discomfort, but it's coming from a place that it makes every one of us stronger and truly makes the sum greater than, than the, or what is it? The whole greater than the sum of the parts. Right? You know, George, the other part of that is the origins of, of where we actually started and, and really origins in education is that really it has been an isolated profession Absolutely. and that every teacher has their own classroom responsible for a certain group of students, mm -hmm. uh, responsible for their success and ensuring that they don't fail. So it really has been an isolated profession all along, knowing that in every single one of those classrooms who are just side by side, we often haven't really access that um, true collaborative processes where we can bring those people together and, as Curtis said, really engage in an effective way that really impacts students. Yeah. So when you're talking about the collaborative response of like having conversations, working together, but also having discomfort, I think this would be great for education. Obviously, this is great for education. Really, it would be good for politics, right? For politicians, maybe they should start. <laughs> maybe they should be, uh, yeah, yeah, we're not going into that space quite yet. There. Well, not. hey, well, there is one thing I want to say about like uh, that I thought about when you said this, and it was it's not mine, but I don't know where I'm referencing it from, and it was like a really interesting point. It was, um, and maybe we're talking, maybe and this is a generational thing because this is how I grew up. I don't know if this is the same from where, where, when you grew up is that we were taught as kids, do not talk politics and religion with strangers, right? You've, you've heard that, yeah, uh, right? Right. And so, um, I saw something that, um, uh, and I thought of this when you're kind of describing what this, this actually means is that when we were kids, we shouldn't have been taught how to actually to not talk politics and religion with strangers, but we should have been taught how to civilly discuss politics yeah. and religion with strangers. And I always thought that was like a really, I was like, that makes so much more sense because I think, you know, you have a generation that never talked about it. 
And now, and now I think we, we don't know how to. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? like, and I think it's yeah. partly some of that, that push pull um, through that process. So I think it, I, I just, yeah. Like when I thought this, I'm like, Oh, like people outside education need this stuff that you're talking about right now too. So um, when you, when you talk about norms, okay. So like, t- yeah. what, like, give me some of that. Like, what is, what does that even look like? So somebody listening to this, like, is it something, are there norms that you suggest? Um, is it something that's created by communities or is there a variation? Like, is there kind of both that actually happen here? Yeah. So it's actually funny uh, because when we were in that school, that school in Claire's home and starting to put some of these pieces in place. I had heard Richard Dufour talk about right. establishing norms as part of a professional learning community and really good stuff. And yeah, that must be for big schools or schools where people don't like each one, each other right. we don't need norms. We, right. we get along. We love one another in this school. And when you started to get into conversations that started to push one another, Oh my goodness, we needed norms. We needed things like we agree that all voices, um, matter in our conversations and then let's talk about what that means and what would be examples of when we're breaking that norm we agree the one that we just thought ah we don't need to say this out loud but we'll arrive prepared and on time to engage in discussion right well your version of of prepared and on time was very different than what i thought that meant and so once you put it up then it allows us a chance to say so what does that mean and do we have ground rules? And in time, those can start to get deeper where we can have conversations of um, what do we do when somebody breaks one of these norms? And again, I've seen schools call them our collective commitments, our rules of engagement. Right, it's, right. It's again, just articulating how we um, how we expect to behave together as adults when we're engaging in potentially contentious mm-hmm. conversations where I might push you on your practice, um, but I'll do it within a a way that we both agree will will work or not just the two of the the team agrees is how we'll interact well and the importance of having them in place guides that interaction that you have with each other but even more importantly is how they're developed yeah. that we develop them collaboratively so that yeah. everyone has an opportunity to identify what are the the norms what what is it that you need to be able to function in this collaborative environment and for them to articulate that but then to combine those ideas with your team so that by the end you've come up with you know seven or eight norms that will really guide that learning that truly represents each individual in that team as well as the collective and i know you've seen this as an administrator george where people will go through that you know they'll put it on a wall in a nice poster it'll, it'll be at the top of our agenda and it means nothing other we, than that activity yeah yeah we <laughs> talked about it once and then we're done right, um, right. But to be able to come and say all right today when we're meeting let's pick the third one and we're going to practice it and at the end we're just going to have a quick conversation on how do we think we did on that well, hey, so one one of the norms I'm actually curious of um, that I've, and I wouldn't say it's collaborative. I just tell people, this is something I expect from you, right? And it's when I'm leading professional learning and I, and, and I want you to think about what it even means, right? So I've, I've shared this is all I ask of you today is to learn in a way you'd expect from your students. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I honestly, let's be honest, adults. Mm-mm-mm-mm. they're not <laughs> okay with it, right like i you know i i get really frustrated when i see um you know like a superintendent say like hey we need to you know uh really kind of understand our student experience and you know be really empathetic and all that other stuff and we need to like learn by example and things like that and then they get a phone call right in the middle and yes. they're like walking out and i'm like oh if a kid did that in your class you would lose your mind Absolutely. right and, and so like so that so then the question is so then the question is they're like so some people get mad when i say it too i say well what what does that look like because like if you if you are on your phone i honestly don't care but i also wouldn't care if a kid did but if you go on your phone but you you'd actually get mad at a kid for doing the same thing then what right and i think it's like yeah and then you get in the well they're not age appropriate blah 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 and i understand that but it's like but how do if you don't teach them how to get there then they don't get there, right? Because like, there's a lot of adults who, you know, like they'll say that's not age appropriate, but then they're totally checked out, you know, of a of a opportunity. I actually remember one time specifically, 
Uh, I had someone, I was on my computer. This is like a long time ago. I don't think this would happen now. I was on my computer during a session and they're like, pay attention. And like, this is a person I don't know tapping me on the shoulder. I'm like, I'm blogging about your session. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm, I'm actually probably the one who's paying the most attention because I'm actually writing what you're saying and, and trying to like understand it. Yeah. And then she kind of was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Right, but she like, but she would, she saw like, you know, but she saw devices as like, yeah. you're obviously not doing stuff. Now, again, this is years ago. Um, so like, what, like, what do you think of that? Is that like totally off base? Have you seen that? No, I think to me, that's bang on. But there's, you know, when you're leading a PD session, um, I mean, you might have some return engagements, but for the most part, this isn't a a group that you are engaging right. with on a regular basis. So to be able to say, this is what I expect and clearly lay it out. And, you know, in, in some cases, you're going to hope that people um, just subscribe or, or um, yeah attend to what you lay out. But when we're a team that's functioning on a regular basis over and over, mm -hmm. once we have those norms, so for instance, that we will be active participants when engaging in, in, team discussions. Then I want to have a conversation. Um, and again, it's it's a process. It takes time. But I want a conversation of, so what does that look like when we're doing it effectively? Right. And what would we not see? And right. let's make that clear and post it right up. And then even getting to that deeper spot of how will we agree to respond when somebody breaks it? Because that's another conversation that we want to have in time. So for instance, I was working with a group of principals. And during the course of six sessions during the year, we started off by laying out what are the norms that we agree that we will follow when we come together for these half day sessions. And so one of them is that we'll arrive prepared and on time. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about in a second session of, so what does that look like when we're doing it well? And again, we were, we were doing it for the purpose of the group, but then also modeling it for us as leaders to be able to do with our own staff teams. Third session was, okay, how will we respond? when this happens. And it was as simple as if somebody arrives uh, not on time, we'll pause and make sure the person's okay first. And then they have to make a commitment of what they'll do to attend to that norm in the future. And it was, it works so effectively that when we did have somebody that, yeah, we're starting at 830 and the person gets in at nine, mm -hmm. we, we looked at each other to go, mm -hmm. okay, are we doing this now? <laughs> Where right. no, we said this. So we pause and Carrie, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, tr I'm okay. Just I got caught at the school. All right, well, you know what we're going to ask, right? Yeah, yeah. My commitment is I'm not stopping at the school before I come to these meetings anymore. Right. Done. But again, that that honors the norm. It shows that it's important for what we're trying to do. and But it's still respecting the person and the, the human being. Right, within right. Too. But again, it's, it's not a one and done process. Uh, we would argue that Good collaboration takes intentionality mm -hmm. and pros process and structures to be able to really get to a place where I can call you out, you can call me out, and we're not doing it because we're being hard on the person. It's right. because we agreed this is what we what we'll do. Yeah, and, and like like I'm like I'm I'm hearing that too, and I'm I'm like, can the, can the, can it ever get to a situation where it backfires? Yeah, I think so, and yeah. I think it depends on. Um, and, we, and we talk about this in collaborative response all the time when mm -hmm. people will ask us a question and, you know, it, the response is, it depends. It depends. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I don't know your staff. I don't know your school. I don't know history. Um, you know, for one person, talking to them quietly after the meeting is probably the best thing to do. For another person, understanding today was a rough day and we're going to let that pass. Yeah. You know, it's it's still knowing the team and and who we are and when we need to lighten up, when when right. we hold each other too. But if you don't have that established, then then you're always shooting at the dark. And when somebody, you know, we just assume everybody knows, for instance, that when we said we'll start at nine, that we'll all get there at nine. And when someone strolls in at nine, ten, you know what this is like as an administrator. Everyone looks at you. To That's say, it. Never. It's never happened. No, yeah. never. <laughs> um, they look at, so is he going to do something? Like, right. what's the response? And if if you haven't, and again, we worked off the assumptions because norms are for people that yeah. don't 
like working together. We love working together. Right. Um, but until we articulated it, it was hard to hold each other to that. Okay, Lorna, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this at you. I'm gonna throw a question at you, see how you deal with this. It's a little bit of a monkey wrench. So I'm gonna challenge oh. you a little bit. So <laughs> so you can say, Well, you agree to those norms, but I was just kind of there. Right? Like because it really like how do you how how do you know you've come to agreement? Like how do you know? Mm-hmm. I think that's that's going to be a question for a lot of people listening is that, mm-hmm. uh, okay, that's great that you're saying that, but who says I agree to that in the first place? Mm-hmm. Is, this like, is this like, hey, this is collaborative, but here's the norms that I've set out for you and you didn't live up to my expectations as opposed to like, how is it actually like, how do you know I agree to it as opposed to I was just there and I'm like, well, I'm not going to not say no because if I say no, then I'm going to, you know, be in trouble. Like, so yes. how, do you deal, how do you deal with that, Lorna? Yeah, you know what? I think this goes back to um, what I mentioned earlier in the fact that you design it collaboratively so that everyone does have input into right. those norms and that through the development of that of them, that you are actually coming to that agreement that when at the end of that time. So, so George, what we do is to be able to say everyone write down those three to five things that they really need to be able mm-hmm. to function in this time together. And then we ask them to find another partner in the room share those with each other and then combine your norms. And some of them are going to be common right right away. And some of them that are a little bit different, is there a way to be able to combine those? So you have both your norms or all of your norms represented in another set. And then you do that again, depending on how many people you have in the room, bringing them together in the end, having every group share And then to take that away, wordsmith it, Mm -hmm. and then ask, uh, bring them back to the group again at the end and to be able to say, um, so are we in agreement? Have we missed anything? Is there anything else that we need to add? So in that way, you represent each Mm -hmm. individual's person's needs, but then combine them in a group recognizing that there there are common needs in our group. And that's really what we're trying to do through Mm -hmm. our norms is um, really make it successful for people to be able to participate. And then they're going to be living and we will make adjustments as we go. And if, yeah, the expectation of arriving on time didn't quite catch it, then Mm -hmm. yeah, let's change up and adjust it. Yeah, because I, like I think a lot of times, like you, you mentioned, I think you mentioned like Richard Dufour and PLCs and things like that earlier, right? And I've actually seen PLCs done horribly, and the yeah. reason why is because uh, someone goes to a conference and like PLCs work, and here's the data, and then they're like, oh, here it goes, and then they don't actually think about the process. They just like mm-hmm. think if we just magically throw in PLCs, uh, we'll get the same results as these other schools. And it's like, well, you're kind of missing a lot of the nuts and bolts behind this, where people actually feel like not I, I don't like saying feeling but actually are part of the process right like they're actually they have ownership over the process as opposed to i saw something from somewhere and we're just implementing it and it's collaborative and i'm like well not really because you just told us and then you're ma- i guess if you want to say you're making us all do it then i guess if that's what you call collaboration i think that's where some of the conversation yeah. comes in. that's where it struggles um i have this question for you and i like i think education is notoriously bad for swinging pe- in pendulums right yeah. so like we talk a ton about collaboration when i was a kid competition was the jam right like i don't know if I, again this is a saskatchewan kid growing up like times tables how i learned them was you had lineups right and they say <laughs> nine times eight and whoever wrote it first stayed in the game right? yeah. and i'll tell you i knew my times tables because of it <laughs> I was pretty good at it. And like, and it was like the, the purpose was for me was, Hey, I will learn my time tables and destroy you. Right. Cause I'm going to win this every single time. Like that was the goal. Right. Like, and there, there's like, so there's some benefit of that. And then, okay. So, well, there was benefit of that to me. Cause I, like, I'm like <laughs> right? um, but so you have this, but then you have this, like, and then it's like, Oh, competition is bad. Everything has to be collaboration. Uh, in some circles. Whereas I know sometimes the best work I do is in isolation where I don't work with you. I actually used to do something with my school that, you know, I would do like these particular days that you were not allowed to email anyone in the staff. You were not allowed to actually, you had to leave everyone alone. 
right? People could just have their own time. And people are like, this is awesome. Like I need just, I need a couple hours where no one's coming in my room. No one's talking to me. And so, so like I, the one concept I talked about in innovators mindset was the notion of competitive collaboration. And yeah. I, it's kind of interesting because when you talked about it, there's a lot of elements of that is how do we both push and support, not, yeah. not just push and, and not just overly support without any challenges. And so like, how, how, like, how do you deal with that? And I, and like, I see you nodding your head. So we know yeah. there's these pendulum swings, like I'm, this isn't just a George thing, but how do you make sure there is that there's, you know, like when we're, we're doing stuff on teams, there are people that thrive doing independent stuff. How do you, how do you deal with that? That kind of, that, that kind of like, you know, that little, that little tension there between the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you want to? Tackle this well, one. Well, I just want to start by saying that we often talk about um, schools when they look at collaborative response. It really is a very contextual um, process, and that they really need to reflect on uh, what they currently have in the school. What are some of the structures that they can uh, adopt, and really recognizing the successes that they already have. So knowing your school well, knowing what you need and being able to put those structures and processes in place. But as we do that, we think about, um, we often describe it as a a river and the banks of the river. And those banks of the river allow us to set structures and processes that are common, that help us to move forward in supporting the needs of students. But we have the river that flows between and that that allows for lots of flexibility, lots of choices, uh, lots of uh, ideas from independence to contribute as well. So there's lots of flexibility within that. Essentially as leaders, don't try and control the flow of the water. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. Right. Micromanage that flow, but we can still set banks that are set some clear, um, expectations around that you know george the other thing that we talk through this um is that it's messy work it's not clear right like right if it's truly a learning process yeah it's it going be. to be messy yeah and there's going to be frustration that comes with it as well but how do we take um the excellence that's happening for each teacher and that's what this work is founded on is that you have good people in your building doing good things this is not a process about fixing bad teachers it's about recognizing that every teacher has expertise and skill and and that individuality right but then how do we bring the best of each person together without scripting practice that we right. have and, and we can set some common expectations for us that we all agree we can subscribe to but then um it's almost like jazz we'll all follow the same basic riff but you know don't try and control what i'm doing on my instrument right, um, right. I need, there's ways that i am going to connect with kids that's going to be very different to you and actually it's that diversity that's going to make us stronger mm-hmm. as a as an organization than trying to all fit into the exact same mold. And in addition to that, being able to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that that expertise exists. We know that everyone has their preferences in how they teach and, and how they learn. But how do we access all of those, that wonderful skill and learn from that? We, uh, the, the one phrase that we often use within this as kind of a key understanding that underlies it is that collaborative response sees every person in the building as an expert and every person as a learner that there's some things that I know how to do really well. Yeah. And there's some things that I have gaps and will always have gaps. So how do we keep moving as a learning organization in that way? Yeah. And I like, I, I love that the, the embracing of the messiness, because I think too yeah. often in schools, we try to make everything so nice and linear for our kids and for ourselves and where you find the beauty is in that messiness. Right. And it, oh, you know, at least yeah. like life is messy. And so it does prepare you for aspects outside of school. Right. And, you know, yeah. within school, I, I, I think there, there's a beauty in that and we need to embrace it more and more. And like when we talked earlier on the other podcast, the, the idea is that you learn, it's not that you don't make mistakes anymore. It's that you learn that there's comfort that you, of course, you're going to make mistakes. So you just, how do you adapt and learn and, you know, kind of let, 
giving yourself some grace through that process. Yeah. So this is the last question I'm going to ask you. Um, people read this book and they, what, like, how, how is it going? What, like, what would you say? And I, this is a tough one, right? How is it going to improve student learning? I think what it does is it pushes back against some traditional practice and understandings that we have. So uh, we're not going to go into, we'll kind of leave this as a bit of a teaser, but right. four key statements that um, we make through presentations that are expanded upon within the book is we're going to reduce the amount of meetings that we have about students mm -hmm. by adding one more that we're going to create an intentional space where we're going to be able to examine practice. And again, it sounds counterintuitive, but if you read the book, it's going to mm -hmm. lay that out. When we have that one extra meeting, we're going to respond to the students by not focusing on individual students. Right. And so again, it sounds counterintuitive, but when, and goes against you, what we you got to read the book to know what that yeah. is. You got it, man. <laughs> um, uh, and then we talk, and this one's key for us is you stop tiering the kids. Um, so we talk about the multi-tiered systems and I mean, our work's heavily influenced by that, that work. There's huge value in it, but I think one of the missteps that happened in it is tiering kids and saying, putting one new label of this is a tier two kid or a tier three kid. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about tier the supports, mm -hmm. you know, that it's a, it sounds like a subtle it's about shift what in language, we do. but to be able to say, George right now is a kid that needs tier four supports in this particular yeah. area. You're not a tier four kid. Um, well, imagine, imagine, you might be, but imagine kids, <laughs> imagine kids saying that about teachers, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, I don't think teachers would be too excited. Like, Hey, well, you know, that was a pretty good lesson, but you know, once you get up to tier three, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like, I don't, you know, I don't think any teacher would be comfortable with that process. Well, and, and I think our big underlying, and it's the statement that, uh, is in our first and last chapter within the book is we believe to our core that every child deserves a team. And we don't mean just the at risk, just the, the certain students privileged, whatnot. Every child deserves a team. And our previous way of thinking about that would make that statement um, overwhelming. Well, how do we make a team? If I've got 1500 kids in this school, mm. I can't possibly have a team for every child. Well, no, if you take a team perspective, you can do it through that, the layering that we talk about for mm -hmm. collaboration, but it, it's our belief that, that every kid deserves a team and, and how do we go about doing that in our system? It's, it hasn't been constructed to lend itself to that. I spent a lot of time in inclusive services over the years and, and uh, really working toward having that team around students who really had uh, intensive needs and and we've always talked about that idea of having a wraparound, wraparound team yeah. for yeah. that one student but our concept is really about how do we provide that same level of support for every student right in our school and it's not easy work no yeah well, hey, I, I'm excited and I'm I'm I you know what just because you're from Alberta I'm really excited that we have a Alberta you know team here writing a new book so hey, congratulations on the release and uh Thanks, i George. i know i know from the work of both of you um is going to be uh, you know it's going to help a lot of people um through the process that don't necessarily have the access uh to you full time but you know can check out that book so make sure you check out the book uh down below and uh thanks for kind of stopping by the podcast <laughs> <laughs> next time <laughs> yeah whatever <laughs> You're close enough. You live. You live. You live close enough that you come visit sometimes. So we'd love to have you over. But that hey, was awesome. fantastic. Thanks everyone for listening, Lauren and Curtis. It was great to have time to connect with you today, and I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy the rest of your conference, and continue to inspire people not just in Alberta but all over the world. So thanks for all you do. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, George. George. Right back at you. Right, we uh, love everything that you do. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Take care, everybody.